I'm Deboki and this is Okie Dokie Boki and today I'm going to be talking about the Ripped Bodices Diversity Report and some of the conversations going on around it. I talked about some of this stuff recently on a live stream that Mari hosted over at My Name is Mari Nez um, along with Paige and Sajid for what is becoming I think like our kind of quarterly tradition of breaking down like the latest and greatest in book community discourse. And I was really glad to have that live stream and those amazing people to help sort out some of my thoughts and I'll link to the live stream down below. Uh, I recommend watching it just because I think we're pretty awesome. As you can probably tell by looking at whatever the duration of this video ends up being, this is going to be a long video because it happens to hit on like what is for me the perfect trifecta of topics. We have romance novels, we have data, we have diversity, things that like on their own I could spend a long time talking about but like put them together and yeah there's like a lot of things that I have been thinking about and they don't always come to like a clear conclusion. So I just, I have a lot of different things that I'm trying to work through. It's also taken me a little bit of a while to figure out how I want to convey my thoughts because I have a lot of frustrations with the medium post that has been informing the conversations I've seen going on around the Rip Bodices diversity report. Those frustrations are based in large part on my own experience as a scientist and now science writer. And they have to do with what are insufficient analyses or straight up inaccuracies going into this critique of the Rip Bodices diversity report and that in turn muddy the conversation around how to engage with this data. At the same time, I think that there is an underlying frustration informing both the critique and the subsequent conversations um, that is based on how we talk about race and how data often gets used to derail conversations around diversity. And I agree with those grievances and think they're really important to engage with because they get to some really necessary questions about what the role of data is in helping us understand and solve problems and also to understand the limitations of data. So I'm going to start by talking about the data critique stuff first and how it fits into conversations about data visualization and data literacy. And then from there, I'm going to get into my thoughts about how we talk about data in the context of diversity conversations. So here is a quick summary of the events, I guess. The Rip Bodice is a bookstore that specializes in romance. And since 2016, they've published an annual State of Racial Diversity and Romance Publishing Report that tracks the percentage of books published in romance that year that were written by BIPOC authors. The authors of this report are booksellers. They are not statisticians. And the report itself is fairly simple. They present the percentages of books published by BIPOC authors by publisher. And they also show a graph of the publisher's percentages over the past few years. They also report the numbers for the combined set of publishers. This year, a criticism of the Rip Bodices report was posted on Medium, authored by Nick and Ari, that was titled The Rip Bodices Diversity Report, A Critique. I'll link to both the Rip Bodices report and this critique down below. Like I said, the conversation I've seen around the Rip Bodices Diversity Report is based largely on this Medium post to quote from their summary. Though well-meaning, a study like this does a disservice to both publishers and BIPOC authors, while also setting a dangerous precedent of allowing poor ethics and poor data practices to run rampant in the romance community. I'm going to be focusing on the arguments they lay out to support this statement because to say it outright, I have a lot of issues with the arguments that they make. My goal is not to say that the Rip Bodice's report is above critique. In fact, I have criticisms of the data and really just of the style of report in general, which I'll get to in later in the video. But the way that we critique data is just as important as the data itself. I argue that it's actually kind of the whole point of data. And so I wanna explain why this critique is not really satisfying to me. A lot of this, as I said, is based on my own past life as a scientist and now as someone who works in science writing slash communication. My background though is in biomedical engineering. So while I am very, very familiar with what it means to deal with messy data, I am less familiar with what it means to deal with social science data. So some of what I'm gonna be talking about is based on conversations I've had with the social scientists in my life. Social sciences are just like any other science or like really any other field. They're varied in their norms and their philosophies and their methodology. And if you talk to different people in different fields about how to study publishing and racism in the publishing industry, they will probably come up with different methods and different approaches based on their background. In some ways, that's part of my frustration with this article. It establishes the sense of like academic universality with some of its points that are just simply not universal. But while I am frustrated with some of these points and at times will be defending some of the Rip Bodice's choices, I again just want to make it very clear that this does not mean that I think that the Rip Bodice's report is above criticism. Like I said, there are things that I'm going to be getting to later in this video about like the shortcomings of these kinds of reports in general. But most immediately, 
ultimately, there are two things where I do agree with Nick and Ari. First, I agree with some of the call for clarity and how the rip bodice is doing their counting. And second, I think it would be useful to see the size of the samples for each individual publisher. These are both things that would allow for better assessment of their methods and of the data that they report. But I disagree with some of the framing used to like define kind of like what the existence of these deficiencies mean in the context of the report. When it comes to the critiques that are being made, I think there are two big things that are being laid out. The first is about the ethics of the rip bodice's methods, and the second is about the presentation of their data. So let's start with the ethics. The Medium Post takes particular issue with the fact that the rip bodice uses interviews, author bios, photographs, and other publicly available information to determine whether or not an author is a person of color. According to the article, this is not ethical because the rip bodice is not getting consent from the authors to do this kind of assignment. And based on their assessment, they write, in a professional setting, a study like this would have been cast aside immediately. And that is just not accurate. There are studies published in academic peer-reviewed journals that use similar methods to assess racial diversity in everything from movies to hospital social media. There are also studies that use names and pronouns and public Facebook for information to label people's genders. And the Medium article itself lauds the Vita Count study, which uses publicly available information to approximate gender diversity amongst writers. The Vita Count study may have a more thought out rubric, and I will always agree with the call for more transparency and more rigor, but the grounds for ethical complaint are inconsistent within this article, and it muddies the discussion around ethics and research. There is a framework around ethics and consent underlying how studies like these are conducted, and there are things like institutional review boards and universities that assess whether your work involving human research subjects is ethical. And it's important to note that according to the guidelines that underline many IRBs, a human research subject is defined as someone who you are gathering data about through interaction or through intervention, or someone whose private identifiable information you're obtaining. That does not describe the kind of work that the RIP bodice and other researchers using similar methods are doing. On the other hand, if you're doing something like a survey, you're interacting with people, which means you're more likely to need like some kind of informed consent going into that study from your subjects. This point might seem like a semantic technicality, but it's an important one that dictates how many researchers in many different fields actually do their job beyond just the scope of this kind of data. And if we're going to turn to technical and academic language about what is considered professionally acceptable, then it's important to be responsible and rigorous about the ways we're using that language. Stating outright that the study would be discarded doesn't reflect the reality of current research. And in stating that it does, we reduce the audience's ability to critically engage with what the current reality of research actually is. Because what I will say is that while these are methods that are used in research settings and academic settings today, best practices and research are always evolving. If you don't feel comforted by the knowledge that these are methods used in actual academic studies, I think that's valid and important. The use of data to make inferences about us is like a big, huge ongoing thing in the 21st century. And the internet has made it so that there is a lot of publicly available information. And adding on gender and race to the dissection of that data makes it all the more uncomfortable, which again, I'm gonna get into more detail later. Race and gender are both social constructs that can't be identified with 100% accuracy without directly asking a person. And that's not always possible. And even when it is possible, it's complicated and loaded by the fact that they have both had their associated categories carved out by centuries of white supremacy and patriarchy. The question of what makes for good and ethical research practices is always evolving, and I think it's going to continue evolving in how we frame like diversity in different areas. But in order to have those conversations that are necessary to figuring out how to like move forward with what are best practices, we need to be accurately describing the frameworks that currently exist and that guide how research is being done right now. In the introduction to their post, Nick and Ari write, we live in a world that is becoming increasingly distrustful of science and lacking in data literacy. And that is a sentiment that is very familiar to me. It's one that motivates me in my own work. Unfortunately, I think the way that they discuss data is itself not rigorous, running contrary to the rigor that they are rightfully asking of the ripped bodice. Because let's be clear, rigor in studies is good. The arguments that I'm about to make should not be construed as me arguing that like making clear visuals and reporting end values are bad. But the article levels multiple criticisms of the ripped bodice visualization and reporting that, similar to their discussion of research ethics, are inexact in ways that muddy the conversation around what we can and can't get out of data. Let's start with the data visualization. 
I should start by noting that the RIP bodice did update their graphs in response to what Nick and Ari posted, but I'm going to focus on the criticisms in the post based on the original graphs because I think it gets to some useful things to think about like when we come across data in the wild. In their post they highlight this graph of Avon's publishing record and they take issue with the fact that like the axes aren't labeled and there's this sort of like perceived ambiguity in the title. I think these are both okay to fair criticisms to make, but I don't think that they reflect poor data practices on the part of the ripped bodice. Yes, in an academic or technical setting, it is pretty much expected that you're going to include all of your axes labels because scientists are pretty heavy handed with their labels, which makes sense when you're conveying like a lot of technical information at once. But leveling this critique at the ripped bodice is weird to me because like, Sure, like, yes, like I agree that axes labels are a good thing for clarity, but also this complaint misses out on the reality of data visualization in non-academic slash technical settings where I've seen plenty of graphs like on all sorts of places that like don't have axes labels, presumably I think to reduce visual clutter. And especially with a graph like this one, I find it pretty hard to mistake 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and so on as anything but years and the percentages as anything but percentage especially because the data points are themselves labeled with percentages. The critique in the post is framed as a good graph should not leave it up to the reader to wonder what is being presented, nor should it leave room for misinterpretation. In practice, that is an unwieldy basis for critique because the entire notion of misinterpretation is subject to what your intentions are with the data. There's this sentence in the book Data Visualization by Kieran Healy that I've been thinking about like whenever I think about like why I'm so hung up on this critique of the axes labels given that like I in general like yeah agree like axes labels are generally a good thing to include. In the book, Healy writes, it is tempting to lay down inflexible rules about what to do in terms of producing your graphs and to dismiss people who don't follow them as producing junk charts or lying with statistics. But being honest with your data is a bigger problem than can be solved by rules of thumb about making graphs. And for me, there's nothing dishonest about the way the RIP bodice is reporting their data. In fact, when it comes to that potential ambiguity around the titles, they actually provide us with the information we need to resolve that question. The title of the original graphs were what percentage of books published in each year were written by people of color. In their critique, Nick and Ari ask whether this percentage that's being presented is like a percentage per pub slash imprint, or is it a percentage per total books across all publishers under study. So here's a representation of what I interpret that question to mean mathematically. So personally, I feel like the graph is pretty clear that the percentage is being reported per pub slash imprint, um, though that's also just because I think that number is the more relevant one. But because of the way that the RIP bodice reported their numbers, we can actually rule out that other possibility entirely, that, that possibility that the percentage is being taken across all publishers. If you add up all of the percentages that were calculated like for each publisher in print um, in 2020, uh, which is helpfully provided in this table, you'll find that they add up to 190.6%, which I think means like in that case where you're saying like these percentages are per all books being studied, that would mean that like of the thousand plus books being studied, like roughly 2000 plus were written by people of color, which isn't possible yet. This is not necessarily going to be a foolproof way to make this distinction. If those numbers happen to add up to less than 100%, then I guess like technically the ambiguity was still there. But I bring it up because I think the most essential part of data literacy is understanding how to use the numbers and graphs that are being presented to you beyond just their mere existence. And this is one small example of how to do that. And going back to that Healy quote, defaulting to rules may seem comforting when we're talking about graphs, but it short changes how we communicate about data. Explaining the standards and rules of data visualization is a useful starting point, but it's not a really like rigorous engagement with the RIP bodice's report. And it's frustrating against this world where data visualizations are becoming more and more popular and where you'll see people arguing about the rules supposedly being broken in a graph without actually substantively engaging with what that means for our interpretation of the results. Data literacy is to me similar to how we talk about books, where it's important to understand how things are being presented to get to the final message of what you're reading. Data visualizations are a way for us to gather meaning and to that end, the choices that you make in terms of like scales and labels and colors are all important and there are practices that make them stronger visualizations. And the rules that we learn about data visualization as scientists are valuable tools in that interpretation, but they're preliminary tools, the way that assessing grammar and writing mechanics are preliminary tools for understanding literature. And I have the same feelings around the discussion of sample sizes in this post, which is a section that I ultimately found unconvincing because I'm not really sure what it is I'm supposed to be convinced of. 
pointing out limitations in data and how we interpret it is a natural part of science, but it doesn't mean that the data is poorly collected. In the original report, the RIP bodice stated that they studied over 1,000 books. That is not a specific number as they point out in this Medium post, but I will say that it's still a number that you could use to guide your analysis by giving it a lower bound. They've since updated their report to state explicitly that in 2020 they studied 2,203 books, but as far as I can see, and if I'm missing it, like let me know, they don't include sample sizes for the individual publishers. Like I said earlier, I agree with the value of having these sample size numbers for the different publishers. I think it would provide a better picture of the publishing industry that could in turn provide more context and analytical power to us as the consumers of this data. However, the critique laid out in the post of like the lack of end values states as follows. This can make the numbers presented inappropriate and meaningless to compare across the years and across different publishers without seeing the raw totals. In some ways, I find this section of their argument the most difficult to engage with because I also find it the most vague. I don't know what it means for this data to be inappropriate and meaningless to compare. I mean, like, Yes, I understand the words. I don't understand how they apply here because inappropriate and meaningless to compare depends on the question that you're asking of the data. And moreover, the whole point of percentages is to give us a way to compare numbers. In this case, they act as a way to normalize the number of books a publisher has published by BIPOC authors relative to the total number of books that publisher has published. And in general, like we deal with percentages without end values all the time. Like when you're comparing free throw percentages between different basketball players, it's true that having the total number of free throws that they've thrown that season can change the way that you compare those numbers and that they, they might tell a different story about what that percentage means. But that doesn't mean that you can't compare the numbers at all. The fact that we don't have the end values for each publisher doesn't make your data inappropriate and meaningless to compare. It means that there are multiple explanations for the data you're observing and that you might not be able to narrow down all of those possible explanations. But you can still engage with those different stories and the different possible explanations that's going on to tease out your analysis and come to a better understanding of your initial question. As an example, one of the arguments made in the post is that if a publisher has published fewer books in a year, then the percentage of authors of color will be like inflated compared to other publishers. And like, sure, that could be a thing that happens. But in 2020, of the 16 publishers that were studied, 13 are reported to have had less than 15% of their books coming from BIPOC authors. So if knowing nothing else about the publishers, we argued that the remaining three could be the result of inflation, we're still coming to the same understanding that publishing is in a pretty starry state. That's a pretty simple analysis and it may not be particularly compelling if your assumption going into the report is that, you know, publishing is super white. And that's fine. My point is not that you have to find the result compelling, just that it's weird to say that these numbers are inappropriate and meaningless to compare. Data is always going to be limited in some way. And so identifying the limitations of your data is kind of like assessing a graph against the rules of data visualization. It's a preliminary step. And just because your assessment of it may be critical, that does not make it in and of itself a rigorous argument. The bulk of data analysis is the work you do after identifying the limitations of the data. That's where the science is, and I would argue that that is the thing that is most important to communicate to a lay audience. If it's not the point of this critique to do data analysis, then that's fine, but then I'm not sure what the audience is supposed to take away from this except a list of limitations that offer really only a surface level understanding of how to critically engage with the data. I've seen some of the conversation around the Rip Bodice's report get framed around this question of like, is bad data worse than no data? I don't know if that's how Nick and Nari would frame their criticism. So like, I'm not going to attribute it to them. And also like, I understand the point of this question and like the impulse behind it in the context of like how we talk about diversity. And again, I'm gonna be getting to that. But I think it really, really, really needs to be stressed, especially if we're gonna be motivated by data literacy and preventing misinformation. There is no such thing as a perfect data set. Like, I mean, I don't know, like maybe there's like a physicist out there who's gonna like quibble with that, but like, they're physicists. In general, like there will always be a limitation to how you can interpret your data. Data is a function of the methods and the world surrounding your measurement. There will be bias in your data and there will be noise in your data. And those can result from like experimental conditions, equipment issues, and of course, just like plain old humanness. The existence of bias and noise in data doesn't invalidate the data. It provides another angle by which you need to assess it. At one point in the Medium post, the authors argue that a survey is a better way to conduct a study like this, though they acknowledge 
acknowledged themselves that, you know, surveys have limitations and can't give us the full picture. It's just that with the right statistical techniques, you can estimate the full picture. And I don't think that this is a clear argument for or against surveys, just as I don't think there's really a clear argument for or against the methods used by the RIP bodice on a data level. These are both just different methods where the methodology itself is going to inform how you assess the data. And I think this is a really important point in conversations around misinformation and data literacy, because I think it's really easy to write off studies based on the limitations of the data without actually critically engaging with the substance of what's being presented. I disagree with the framing of most of Nick and Ari's critique, but I think they're arguing in good faith with the data being presented. But thinking beyond the scope of this conversation, I, like probably a lot of you, have interacted with people who make arguments about the limitations of data in bad faith. For example, something like that maybe you've seen come up in like conversations about like the pay gap between men and women, um, or sometimes like there are these people, again, usually acting in bad faith who might say something like, well, this number doesn't reflect the fact that maybe women are just interested in jobs that are lower pay. And technically they're correct if you're looking just like at the one number that is just how much the average man makes versus how much the average woman makes without factoring in different types of jobs and all of that, that maybe women are just interested in jobs that are lower pay. But just because that's a limitation in the data doesn't mean that A, the data is meaningless, and B, that that possible limitation isn't itself part of the story. Because sure, it could be that women are interested in jobs that are lower pay, but like, what if there's a reason for why women are drawn to jobs or hired for jobs that are lower pay? You know, reasons like the systematic devaluation of women's work. This one data point isn't going to answer that question, but that doesn't mean that the data point itself is bad. And I think understanding that is especially important because we're living in a world where data is increasingly available and the people using it are not always going to be trained statisticians. There's this one phrase in the Medium post that is kind of like stuck with me above all of the other phrases. And it's this moment where they write that this is why not everyone is, nor should they be conducting research studies. And this is the part that like I am constantly hung up on because I think it's like the closest thing I feel to like a conclusion from this critique. And it seems to be that they're arguing that the ripped bodice shouldn't be doing these kinds of reports because they don't have the training or expertise for it. I think if I had read the rest of this critique without coming across that sentence, I would be less frustrated by it. Because like, look, there are things that I agree that the RIP bodice could do to improve their report. But as I laid out with my earlier points, I don't think that this critique has made a convincing argument to me that this report is deficient in a way that suggests that the RIP bodice shouldn't be doing it. And so against this backdrop, I just find this phrasing very gatekeepy and it misses out on the reality of like data as a popular medium that involves non-stats, people who are both producing and consuming it. It makes me think of this kind of like common trope in like the discourse around science and science communication, particularly in the context of misinformation, which suggests that our savior against misinformation is going to be expertise. And I think the reality is much more complicated than that. Look, I believe in expertise. I would not have gone through seven years of a PhD if I didn't. I think expertise has value in establishing people's qualifications so we can understand what they bring to the table. In the context of the Rip Bodice's report, I think the expertise they bring is their experience with book selling and the publishing industry, like expertise that a social scientist may not have. The fact that they don't have a stats background does influence my reading of the report, but it does not undermine it. I think that contending with conversations around data literacy and misinformation shouldn't be about establishing who is and isn't allowed to collect data, but rather about helping audiences understand what it means to work with data and to interpret it. And to this point, the Medium Post makes a number of arguments about what we can't take from the data. And I would appreciate that, except that it's presented as like, potential harms of the report in a way that like I don't understand or agree with. Like when they point to media sources that might mistakenly report on the data or to writers who might use the report to like make decisions about who they're going to pitch their books to. And I just fundamentally disagree with the framing of this argument because it ignores the responsibility of the media and the agency of the reader. Every week I read from different fields and then I have to make a call on like what I'm gonna be talking about and how I'm gonna be talking about it. If I were to talk about the Rip Bodice's report, I would probably provide a lot of caveats around it and what kind of interpretations you could draw. That's my job. Does the media always get it right? No, but that is on the media. And as for the possibility that people might like use it to decide where to pitch without like fully understanding all of like the publishers involved, if the Ripped Bodice's report were being presented as a guide to like 
who you should be pitching to or even like, you know, like as a guide for like who you should be buying from. Like, yeah, I would, I would agree. Like, don't do that. Like that would be bad. But as far as I've seen, I don't think that they've done that. So the fact that there are people out there who might misinterpret the data in this way is ultimately more about the conversations we're having with ourselves and with each other as readers and writers. And I say conversation because that is to me, like how I frame my consumption of data. It's always part of a conversation. I've been defending the rip bodices diversity report throughout this video, but I'm actually like pretty ambivalent about reports like these because for me, they're just like not my preferred mode of engaging with data. To me, data is a tool for storytelling. It's a thing best dissected in conversation, whether that's with other people or with words being used to form arguments around that data. When I was in lab, we thought of our data in terms of like the story that we were telling, which is not like some kind of like misleading thing. It's just like, you know, like how are we building our argument and how does our data fit into the argument that we're laying out? Like, how does it support that? You know, just like writing an essay, except you're including like, visuals and numbers alongside your words. And that's present in academic writing, but it's also a part of popular data writing as well. I know 538 is not everyone's cup of tea, but one of the things that I've liked about 538 and think is underappreciated about them is that they aren't just a data site with pretty graphs. They use writing and multimedia to actually discuss their data and to like explore the implications of their models. And I would argue that their real value lies not in the numbers that they calculate, but in the ways that they explain and discuss those numbers. And so for me, reports like the Rip Bodice don't really do a whole lot because they kind of just like present the numbers with like little additional analysis. They tend to take a let the data tell its own story kind of thing with like, you know, maybe like a lukewarm conclusion at the end about the state of the publishing industry, but like not really any particularly teased out or nuanced argument. And of course there are a lot of reports like this in a lot of different areas and they are important. They like do play a role in understanding different things in the world and nature and like helping people like evaluate things. So like, it's not that I think reports are bad. They are just something for me as a person like with my own particular like motivations they just don't really do a whole lot for me until there's like a story that like I can see being put together through those reports and my thoughts around reports like that like extends especially like to like when we're talking about diversity I think a train of thought that's both in the medium post and the conversations around the report is the fact that like you know come on like a lot of us in the book community like we know publishing is racist and super white. And while that is not really a thought that like informs my own particular feelings about this data, it is a thing that I like feel generally. The Rip Bodices report does like a little bit to satisfy my own curiosity about like how white publishing is, but it does nothing to like change the amount of outrage I feel about publishing and like the state of it in this world. I said earlier that data is becoming an increasingly popular medium and I like that in as much as I like data as a tool for helping us understand the world. But I'm also incredibly uncomfortable with the ways that data has become fetishized in the world as this kind of like false bearer of objectivity when the fact is that data both in its collection and its analysis is a reflection of our own interests and biases. During Mari's live stream, she talked about how data has become this kind of like overwhelming and kind of like aggravating aspect of DEI work. And I think that's a product both of how we deify data and how conversations around racism are derailed by data. When I think about this, I think about like how in the past year, it kind of feels like every school I've ever been to has sent me, you know, some kind of like DEI survey or like some other kind of questionnaire about racism. Like, so for example, I went to Caltech as an undergrad, which is a small math, science, engineering oriented school. It's very much the kind of place that's like, hey, like we can genius our way through racism. And I am like not making that up. In June, 2020, following the Black Lives Matter protests, our alumni association sent out an email that included the following. We are a community that acts. Presented with an intellectual challenge, we would heartily dive in and puzzle it out. The issue of racism against the black community in particular should be no different. A few sentences later, they add, to this end, we must adopt a Caltech level approach to address discrimination, racism, and oppression. In the same way that space exploration, directed evolution, gravitational wave research, and so many other Caltech pursuits advance humanity, we must take this privilege of education and our position to improve society. This is an email that made me mad because it is in no way surprising to me that, you know, our school would compare gravitational wave research to racism. When I was at Caltech, the student body was like about 30% female and most of the non-whiteness came from like 
Asian students like me, which is not really a good indicator of diversity. A lot of my feelings about how we fetishize data and science when we talk about diversity comes from my experience at Caltech, but not in ways that are flattering to my education. And somehow, we keep managing to outdo ourselves. Like there's been this whole thing in the past year about like, you know, it kind of came out that like we have some buildings that are named after eugenicists, like including my, my undergrad dorm and like, you know, like straight up influential scientists who advocated for compulsory sterilization, who have had their names on prominent buildings, you know, like the real classics racism wise. But of course, God forbid they just rename the buildings. No, they had to send out a survey to ask us about all of our thoughts. And even when they like put together this whole committee to figure out like what they were gonna do, it turned out there were people on the committee who were like, I don't know, was eugenics actually bad or was it a product of its times? A mess, like it was just like, it was just bad. They did eventually decide to rename the buildings and we just got like this whole email about how they're gonna move forward. And I guess there's some legal stuff because it turns out some of these things like are technically gifts. And I guess the requirement of the gift was that like you have to have the name attached. I don't know rich people shit. I understand that there were practical realities that like maybe had to go forward in terms of figuring out how to execute this whole thing, but I am still just stuck on how long and how much effort it took them to figure out like how, like what to do about something that to me in the context of like racism discussions is like actually like not like barely even the bare minimum. Like in terms of things that are gonna like impact current students, it's a thing that's like good, but like this is not the stuff that's gonna like make the most meaningful impact. And even then it took them so long. And so when I see DEI surveys from like whatever schools or whatever I've been to, I think of that sequence of events and like how even with this very narrow and actionable problem, the conversation became so fraught with what are like depressingly familiar sets of arguments. So even looking at like these more quantitative surveys, my question becomes like, what is the point of this survey? Like, like what will my numerical judgments of like agreeing and disagreeing with various statements about student life mean to you in terms of understanding my experience at whatever place? And what does it mean to you in terms of like what you're gonna do going forward? And moreover, if you rely on quantifiable data as a way to inform your goals and checkpoints, then your goals are going to be restricted to things that are quantifiable. And that's not great when we're talking about racism, which isn't just a numbers problem, it's an everything problem. There are things from my experience as a brown woman in media that you can quantify as part of a statistic, like say, getting offered a freelance rate that's not just pitiful, it's also 20% lower than the rate given for the same work to a white guy with less experience. There are also parts of that experience that you can't easily quantify, like say, the demoralizing waste of time and energy that's spent negotiating that rate after being told for months that your work is so strong, and in particular, having to remind your manager that using your internship salary, which barely qualifies as a salary, to then negotiate the actual freelance rate that you are expected to make a career out of is bullshit on multiple levels. Oh, and then at the end of the negotiation, being patronizingly told that like, oh, hey, but it's good that you didn't accept the first offer. In general, I think that reports like the Rip Bodices or like the Vita Count, they're simply trying to illustrate like a part of that picture. And the extent to which that part is very narrow is ultimately kind of a strength when applied in the right context. It's specific and given the many varied ways that racism and sexism manifest, I think it can be useful to be able to like pinpoint a specific number that way, like a specific aspect of that experience represented by that number. But also it's a number that can't fully capture the issue of racism in public. Publishing. Like Nick and Ari point out, for example, it's not going to tell you like whether the books themselves are like still reinforcing a lack of diversity in the industry's output. There's no data set that's going to be able to represent the entirety of racism. But I think what becomes frustrating about data in the context of diversity discussions is the way that it compels us to have this conversation about a complex multi-pronged issue that is also deeply personal on very narrow impersonal terms. And it can become a way to make people feel like they have to prove that they've been mistreated with like numbers rather than just like relying on the realities of their day-to-day -day experiences and like their explanations for it. And also to prove that there is like a net quantifiable benefit to treating us all equally. And that is just so unbelievably aggravating. I don't remember the surveys going around to justify making places super white. So like what numbers are you looking for to explain why you should make them less white? What numbers are you using to determine what is and isn't a problem? And what numbers 
measures are you using to determine what is and isn't progress? I think those kinds of questions and experiences inform a lot of people's frustrations with the ripped bodices report. And I think all of those are important. Even if I disagree with the substance of their critique and the way it talks about data, I think the underlying frustrations that Nick and Hari have hit on are real and they're really key parts in understanding like what terms we want like these discussions on diversity to be like happening on. And part of the difficulty too, which I think underlines the questions around the rip bodices methods is the fact that like race is messy to quantify because it's even messier to qualify. A lot of the diversity conversations I tend to focus on are ones focused in America where the phrase person of color or BIPOC have a specific relationship to like the history of whiteness in this country and the way that it's like practically a currency. It's not a framing that applies to all countries and even in America it is a messy framework that compresses a lot of the very distinct ways there are to not be white. And the question of how to label an author's race based on publicly available information is uncomfortable for a lot of people and I think rightfully so. We live in a world where people use publicly available information whether that's you know your skin or your hair or your voice or whatever to make inferences about race and they do that sometimes to deeply uncomfortable and even violent ends. I think it's hard because so much of our issue of wanting to better understand diversity in our world is inherently tied up with the fraughtness of gathering data about diversity in the world. And so when we talk about diversity it becomes so many layers of frustration stacked on each other. It's starts out with feeling like you're expected to prove with data that like racism is real and then stacked on that is the fraughtness of gathering that data and stacked on that is the anxiety that like the data still might not work that something in it will not be convincing or that it just won't be enough to convince like the right people to care and to act in a meaningful way. Data and data literacy is not going to fix that. We're not going to be able to data our way through racism but data is also not going anywhere and it's going to continue to be a part of our discussions. I think this is why I have so many thoughts and feelings about being able to talk about like the critiques of the graphs and the data like in a constructive way. I think it's going to be an increasingly important part of understanding not just the world around us but like understanding the conversations that are being had about that world. Data is only as effective as the analysis that goes into it. You need words and images that like go with those numbers. The best data reporting these days doesn't just rely on graphs. It matches those graphs to people's experiences combining the two to tell a story. Because ultimately no data set is going to be able to capture the complexity of racism in publishing, nor is any data set going to be able to predict the best way out of this situation. What we need is to be able to understand the stories being told both quantitatively and qualitatively that shape people's experiences in the industry. And I don't have a clear cut answer on how to do that because like right now I, I, I don't know that there is one. It's like reading a book, you build and you build on what is presented to you, matching it to what you've read before and keeping it in mind with the things you're gonna read in the future. So thank you guys for watching. Thanks for sticking through this whole video if you've made it to this part. Um, and yeah, bye.